Come to Lucian Welcome. My name is Wes, and this is Addicted to Adventure, your base camp to explore the treasures and mysteries of the adventure genre. Today we're talking about episode six of National Treasure Edge of History. A lot of stuff happens in this episode, lots of twists and reveals. Are they any good? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. As before, there will be spoilers, so you're forewarned. Let's go. We start exactly where we left off, with Jess riding away in Billy's Jag. Billy insists that they got off on the wrong foot, you know, when she abducted Sneakers and held him hostage. What's a little abduction among friends? <sighs> Billy casually mentions that she knew Jess's dad, Raphael, when they both started looking for this treasure 20 years ago. She shows Jess a Daughters of the Plumed Serpent necklace. You're a daughter of the Plumed Serpent? Yes. She insists that it's all been a misunderstanding that they're actually on the same side, and offers to buy her a fancy dinner and tell her everything she knows. At dinner, Jess asks to see Billy's medallion. When it's pointed out that it could be a fake, or purchased on the black market, Billy produces a picture of Jess's dad Raphael with another man, Billy's brother Sebastian. She reveals that her brother was murdered by Salazar, the same man who murdered Jess's dad. This medallion we both wear is a promise. A duty to keep the treasure safe for men like him. We can do this together, Jess. She also casually mentions that this is Jess's opportunity to validate her mother's life's work. We're laying on the manipulation a little thick. Liam has been working against you for quite some time. That's why he offered to steal the journal for me. If I hadn't taken him up on his offer, he would have just sold it to someone else. So Jess goes to Billy's swanky jet to see Meriwether Lewis's journal. She-Hulk introduces herself to Jess like they're old friends. Hey, sorry about impersonating a federal law enforcement officer, kidnapping your friend, and chasing you around Baton Rouge. But no hard feelings, right? Using the journal, Jess deciphers the Elvis riddle immediately. The twin-tongued serpent's tail is revealed in fair weather by the vent. Maybe it's not a bend in a river. It's, it's a bend in, in the, the strap. strap. <laughs> it's a broken word puzzle. What is a broken word puzzle? Something puzzle geeks know. Basically, you pull the leather strap through the holes cut in the page and see what letters line up with the string. I'm not trying to beat up on this show, but I just don't think this is as cool as the show makers think it is. I also think it happens a little too quickly to be satisfying. I, I'm not saying it has to take hours of screen time or anything, but, you know, maybe take a few seconds to make it appear as if it took a little bit of effort. I think that would go a long way. That's the problem with giving Jess Rain Man powers. She's supposed to be so superhumanly smart that puzzles and riddles bow down at her feet. And codes. I imagine they lie down for you, like lovers. I'm sorry, but that's just kind of boring. The genius protagonist thing is seriously overused first off, but on top of that, it requires some context to work properly. Sherlock Holmes is probably a genius. Certainly he performs great feats of deductive reasoning, but that's made believable by a couple of things. Firstly, his conclusions are always explained for us troglodytes. And secondly, he's eccentric enough that you can kind of accept it. Sherlock Holmes is not what you'd call a well-rounded person. Uh, similarly, Ben Gates from the National Treasure movies. Say what you will about Nicolas Cage, whether you love him or hate him, he put enough eccentricity into that performance that it kind of makes his wacky conclusions that much more acceptable, that much more believable. Now him managing to bag a German supermodel at the end of the movie, well, that's another story. As for Jess, she's just some incredible genius with virtually no flaws. She'd be cracking codes and riddles right now for the FBI, except those insensitive jerks won't hire her because she's not a citizen. I'm sure lots of countries hire plenty of foreign nationals to work for their agencies that handle foreign counterintelligence. I hate to say the Mary Sue word, but... Oh, there it is. There it is. Anyway, the next clue is Alamo Well, so apparently the third puzzle box is in the well at the Alamo. Billy has one of her staff bring the obsidian and jade puzzle boxes. Jess expresses surprise that she has the jade box. 
Liam sold it to me. He told me he disappeared when his dad died. Billy shows Jess that the first two puzzle boxes are magnetically attracted to each other and guesses that with their powers combined, the magnetism will lead them to the third puzzle box like dowsing rods. Back in Jess and Tasha's apartment. Your feedback on my gala protest has reminded me exactly why I do this. I represent you, the people, and we're here to make change. If you see something, say something. It's what I live by. It... And I gotta go. I hate this character so much. Who elected you, O oh lover of democracy? Jess expresses disbelief that Liam stole the journal. Tasha tells her to forget about Liam and wants to plan their next step. However, Jess, thinking about Salazar and the danger he represents, tells Tasha that she wants to work alone from now on. Excuse me, you would have been worse than arrested if it weren't for me. I know, but I thought you were going to get arrested because of me. You took it way too far. Just you asked me for a diversion, and now you're criticizing me for it. I asked you to make a scene, not cause a revolution. You didn't have to go full Occupy Wall Street. You could have knocked over a tray of food, but you chose to make it about your agenda. Are you being serious right now? This is exactly why I didn't want you to go to the ball in the first place. I mean, she's right. Tasha gets upset and leaves, telling Jess... From now on, you're on your own. Which was exactly what she wanted in the first place. Tasha goes over to Oren's place, where he consoles her with chocolate, peanut butter, and a viewing of Captain America the Winter Soldier. Sneakers uses his deep insight to compare Tasha and Jess to Cap and Bucky. I mean, that's you and Jess. Steve and Bucky were BFFs, right? But Steve always has Bucky's back. Till the end of the line. You and Jess are going to get through this, just like Cap and Bucky. This apparently reignites an old spark, because the next thing we see is Sneakers making breakfast for two. Sneakers, dude, I know we've had our differences, but you can do better than Tasha. Some talky stuff happens, then Jess goes to Sadusky's house to find Liam. When she arrives, the door to the secret library is open, and the room has been ransacked. Suddenly, Jess is grabbed from behind by Jerry Garcia, who drags her out of the secret room, telling her, I won't let you find the treasure. But never fear. She-Hulk arrives, commands the man to let her go, and he smashes through the window to escape. In the secret room, Casey explains that the man who attacked Jess works for Salazar, and we finally get a little bit of backstory for Billy. She is not the bad guy. Jess, she never was. According to Casey, Billy and her brother were orphaned when a car bomb killed her parents. And after Salazar killed her brother, she had no one. Casey lived on the street before Billy took her in and paid for her education and gamma ray treatments. Back on Billy's jet, we learn Jerry Garcia's real name, Maddox, and that Salazar isn't far behind. Agent Ross and the High Priest of Science are having an informal coffee date while going over the evidence of Sadusky's murder. There's a lot of stuff in this scene that I'm not going to cover, but the high points are that Agent Ross knows more about Jess and her activities than we thought, and that she's searching for information about Billy. We also learn a little bit about her motivation. She was transferred from Washington, D.C. to Baton Rouge after she arrested the wrong person, allowing a murderer to kill again. Jess, Billy, and Casey form a plan to dress as war reenactors and use the Battle of the Alamo reenactment as cover to enter the well and search for the third puzzle box. Jess arrives back home and, not finding Tasha, leaves a note. Tasha arrives sometime later and finds the note, but we don't get to know what's in it. Weepy the White Knight brings coffee to Mina, who works at the hospital. On his way out of the hospital, Weepy sees Liam's tuxedo covered in blood in a laundry cart being pushed by someone on the hospital staff. This leads him to discover a battered Liam lying unconscious in a hospital bed. On the flight to Texas, Jess and Billy talk about Jess's mom, Manuela. Jess mentions that her mom was a rabid soccer fan, and Billy agrees. This seems like a stupid detail to include, but it matters for later. They arrive at the Alamo in period dress. She-Hulk tranquilizes the park ranger on duty right as the reenactment starts, meaning they have mere minutes to investigate the well and find the puzzle box. This place is the beginning of when Mexico lost Texas to the United States. I know. And when we find that treasure, we will restore glory to all indigenous people. 
I don't understand Jess's obsession with Texas. But more importantly, this is an example of what I mean when I say that the scenes in the show that have political messaging are stilted and weird. What she just said was a complete non sequitur. It didn't make any sense. That's like if I were to say to you, A New Hope was the beginning of the Star Wars saga. And you say, I know, and when I find my copy of The Wrath of Khan, we will restore all glory to Battlestar Galactica fans. That would make as much sense as what just happened on screen there. In the hospital, Liam wakes up and tells Ethan that he stole the journal because he saw Billy arriving at the governor's ball and had to keep it out of her hands. When he got outside, he was blindsided by She-Hulk and then thrown unconscious into the river. <laughs> She kicked my ass. It becomes apparent to both of them that they need to find Jess. At the Alamo, Jess climbs out of the well empty-handed. Concerned about time, she urges Billy to leave before they get caught. Billy refuses and demands the satchel holding the relics, insisting on looking in the well herself. Across the street, we learn that Tasha and Sneakers have driven to the Alamo and are looking for Jess in the crowd. Just as the reenactment begins moving towards the Alamo, Jess releases the winch that held open the steel grate over the well, trapping Billy. She looks in the satchel, but the relics are not inside. As Jess weaves her way through the mass of battle reenactors, Billy calls She-Hulk on the phone, warning her that Jess is escaping with the relics. She-Hulk activates their contingency plan, revealing that several of the reenactors are working for Billy. Two reenactors box Jess in, but Jess grabs one of their flintlock pistols. This causes the Mexican army reenactors to charge and provides enough of a distraction for Jess to escape the grasp of her attackers. Still working her way through the crowd, Jess's arm is grabbed by Tasha, who leads her to Oren's van. Just as they enter the van, She-Hulk appears like a Terminator chasing John Connor. Tasha pepper sprays her in the face, and Jess kicks her out of the van door, allowing the group to escape. I, for one, will never forget the Alamo. The group puts their phones in a Faraday bag so Billy can't track them. How did you track me? I got your letter. The one that said not to follow me. You should have cleared your browser history because boy, do you remember the Alamo. Enough with the Alamo jokes. Who wrote this scene? My dad? At a roadside diner, Jess fills in Tasha and Oren. Billy pulling a family pick out was love. Actually, that's how I knew she was lying. The buttons on my dad's shirt were on the wrong side. I noticed my dad's shirt buttons were flipped. So that's how I knew the image was Photoshopped. Men's shirts all have buttons on the right. Women's shirt buttons are all on the left. Why? Actually, it's because most people are right-handed. So getting dressed is even easier for men, seriously. Tasha, you can f all the way off. Historically, actually, men dressed themselves and women were dressed by servants. All of the clothing was designed to be easier for right-handed people because 90% or more of the world population is right-handed. It's just that women's were designed so that the person dressing them had an easier time of it right-handed. Such oppression. And of course, Sneakers acts like a complete dumbass. You'd think somebody obsessed with fashion would know this. Also, this scene is a pretty good example of why I call Jess Rain Man, because you kind of have to pay autistic levels of attention in order to catch that your dad's shirt was reversed. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's implausible enough to make it hard to believe. On the plane, I brought up how much my mom loves soccer. Your mom hated soccer. Billy didn't know that. This is actually a clever thing to do, and it's literally all you had to do. As a matter of fact, the shirt button thing should have been deleted from the script in favor of this. So the entire time Billy was trying to catfish you, you were catfishing her. Here it is again. The writers are trying to use modern jargon that they don't understand. This is not what catfishing means. Catfishing is making a fake online persona to lure people into relationships. You're using it wrong. Jess says again that she doesn't want to endanger anyone else, but her friends insist they're sticking with her. Jess says that the puzzle box must be in Viesca, Mexico, which used to be called Alamo. She doesn't have to do any research or problem solving. She just knows this. Back at the Alamo, Billy gets arrested. As the police are putting her into a cruiser, she nods at She-Hulk, who makes a phone call to Sadusky's nurse, Miles. Miles goes to the FBI building and gives a USB drive to Agent Ross. What is it? It's a recording. Mr. Sadusky was a paranoid man, and he recorded everything. I think Jess Valenzuela murdered him. 
At the diner, Tasha has bad news. In Viesca, Mexico, a bank was built over the top of the well in the 1920s. To make matters worse, 20 years ago, someone broke into the bank and blew a hole in the floor to reveal the well. That person was Diego Salazar, who was caught and is still in prison for the crime. I have to go talk to him. Salazar is the only one that knows what happened to that box. Why would you risk going to Mexico for that? Salazar killed my dad. I just found out from Billy. Billy, catfish queen. Oh, she's not a catfish. That would require going to Mexico and you can never come back. My bag's already packed. Nothing about Jess's character adds up. She's inconsistent, her motivations change with the wind, and she's really badly written. None of it adds up. She wants to spend her life solving puzzles for the FBI, but is willing to flush it down the toilet at the drop of a hat? I, I don't get it. Uh, I still think Billy's the most interesting character in the show, although that's probably not saying a whole lot at this point. Which, of course, brings me to politics. There were a lot of politics in this episode. If you ever wonder why YouTubers get bent out of shape about this, I think I'm starting to figure out why. When you have politics injected into your entertainment, it's like being flicked in the ear. The first time or two, you tell yourself that it probably shouldn't bother you, so you try to ignore it. But as you keep getting flicked in the ear, you become more sensitive to it. And it starts to really piss you off. Part of the problem, I guess, is that in order to make these videos, I have to watch each of these episodes three or four times. And by that time, my ear is sore and I'm having trouble letting it go. It's kind of like the difference between walking past a manhole cover and getting that momentary smell of sewage versus having to dive into the sewer. We haven't really talked much about the larger overarching story of the series as a whole. I find it strange that the writers picked a treasure hidden by three prominent pre-Columbian civilizations, two Mesoamerican and one South American, and then tried to tie that into U.S. history. It's kind of a stretch for me. Even in the second movie, when they find Cibola beneath Mount Rushmore, as absurd as that sounds, that is actually kind of in keeping with real legends of Cibola. Now, I don't think they're actually following any actual legends for this show. I think they made it up out of whole cloth, which is fine. You can totally do that. Just make it good. I'm able to let a lot of stuff go if the show is fun. And I'm not saying there hasn't been any fun in this show. I'm just saying that the fun has been largely overshadowed by politics and teen drama. At this point, I'm starting to believe that the makers of the show wanted to create a political platform first, a young adult drama second, and making a fun adventure series was somewhere farther down the list of priorities. I'm lowering my grade again. I'm giving it a B plus at this point because I'm, I'm losing goodwill. What do you think? I always wonder if I'm being too hard on the show. Let me know in the comments if you think I'm off base. As always, if you like what I'm doing here, please like and subscribe. It really does help out the channel. And until next time, fortune and glory, my friends.